Hi everyone, my name's Ellie, I'm your host for this live lounge and I'd like to welcome you to the University of Lincoln, the world's number one modern university according to the Times and Sunday Times and all around brilliant institution and I'm so proud to introduce our two speakers tonight. We have the amazing Chris Packham who owns two dogs called Sid and Nancy. He's got a stepdaughter called Megan he is an all-round amazing guy. He's a presenter, a passionate advocate for the environment. He's got an amazing sister who's a fashion designer, and I suspect he may be sporting one of her jackets tonight, but we'll find out that later. And he's also won our hearts, and we're really proud that he's a visiting professor here at the University of Lincoln. With Chris is the amazing VP Campaigns and Environment, uh, Bailey Marchant. Bailey got a first in physical geography here at the University of Lincoln and has stayed on as a sabbatical officer. She has a cat but used to have chickens and rabbits uh, and also worked as a nature reserve assistant. Bailey is again really passionate about nature and the environment and loves to dance. So hi and thank you for coming. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, thank you. So today we're gonna to be tackling, or well, we're gonna be talking about tackling environmental challenges. But before we do that, we're gonna kick off with a quick fire quiz round for Chris from Bailey. So Bailey, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, yeah, I have a couple of questions for you, Chris. So firstly, what is your favorite bird of prey? Well, it's a challenge because there are so many attractive and exciting species and we're quite well off in the UK for birds of prey. We have the fastest animal in the world, the peregrine falcon, which when I was your age, Bailey, was quite a rare bird. But they've bounced back now and they're breeding in many parts of, of the UK, including Lincoln, um, capable of stooping at 200 miles an hour. So that takes some beating. But I'm going to choose a bird which is closer to my home. I do my favourite animals are invariably those that I have a closer association with. Um, so I'm going to say male sparrowhawk because very occasionally I get catch a glimpse of one zooming through my garden as it attempts to snatch uh, a goldfinch or a greenfinch or a great tit from my feeder. Um, and they're so dashing and they're one of those species that when you catch a glimpse of them, you always are left wanting more. Um, but they're pretty quicksilver and so even in a lifetime I think that I could you know away from the nest uh, you know just sort of casual observation I've probably not spent more than 10 minutes watching them but I, I, I always crave another glimpse of a male sparrowhawk beautiful blue orange chest bright burning orange eyes exquisite that sounds really good. Yeah, I think mine is probably closer to home as well because I'm from Norfolk and I used to work on a nature reserve here. And I think a marsh harrier is my favourite. And I think this is one of the only places that you can see those in the UK. So, that's well, it. yeah, I mean, again, you know, going back again, when I was your age, I <laughs> asked my father, slightly younger actually, um, but I asked my father to take me all the way to Norfolk to see marsh harriers because at that time they were on the brink of extinction in the UK. Um, there was just a handful of them hanging on at Minsmere RSPB Reserve. We, we did see them, um, thank goodness, because he, he dragged the Austin Maxi all the way from Southampton to Minsmere. Um, uh, but they again, rather like the peregrines, have bounced back. And I think we've got in the region of 350 to 400 pairs. But you're absolutely right. To see them gliding over the reeds in, in Norfolk is, is fantastic. It is. Um, so next question is, what is your favourite or most interesting animal fact? I like the fact that we know that butterflies and moths in the adult stage of their life cycle can remember being caterpillars. Because I think that when we think of that remarkable metamorphosis where a caterpillar turns into a moth, we imagine that the organism completely disintegrates and is essentially almost reborn as the winged adult. But um, we know through very simple experimentation, in fact, that they, they remember being caterpillars. What they remember of it, of course, we don't know, but, but they do remember being caterpillars. So I, I love that little gem of, of biological knowledge. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Uh, I think my favourite fact is that wallabies can um, actually suspend pregnancy. I think that's crazy. Um, found that out at the Wildlife Park. And I I hope for years, you. my mother wished that she'd suspended my pregnancy. <laughs> with you. Um, next question is, what is the best thing about your job? 
meeting people like yourself who have a shared passion for the environment and a desire to look after it, uh, learning things from them um, and being inspired by their energies and motivation. A lot of people imagine it would be for me getting to see the animals. And that, of course, is an enormous privilege. Sometimes I'm able to, you know, travel short distances or around the UK or, uh, you know, formerly, of course, pre-COVID overseas from time to time to see exciting animals. But meeting experts and learning from them means that my life is a, a learning experience. And I, I love the fact that there's always something more to know and there's always someone out there who knows more than you do. Um, and, and if you're fortunate enough to meet them and, and, and converse with them, then, then you learn. So, yeah, that's the best bit of my job. How about you? What, what's the best bit of how I hear? I'm going to throw my back. What was the best bit of being at, at Lincoln University as an undergraduate? I think um, as soon as you get to university, you have access all of a sudden to so many incredible people that actually do the research that you've been learning about in school previously. And you just get a sort of audience with them all of a sudden. And so you can just go crazy with questions and ask them sort of straight from the source. Where did you get that data from? Or what does that mean? Or just help me, I'm confused. <laughs> but just I think having those amazing people just at your disposal almost is is probably the best thing. And the best thing about my job now is getting to share, like have that audience with students. So now I have like my vlog series where I talk about how to be sustainable and things like that. And I've got, you know, a whole student body that are just waiting to sort of learn from me, which is incredible. So, mm. yeah. and last question for you is, um, so I've seen you've been doing your self-isolating bird club uh, with Megan. So what is your um, sort of bird watching tips sort of maybe aimed at my age because I don't see many other people many other 21 year olds in a bird hide and I'm wondering what are your tips for people my age to get out and about and see the birds no I think that's fair enough though when, when you're 21 there are other things to occupy your mind and, <laughs> and life um, but what we know is that if um, young people younger people particularly say between the ages of 9 and 15 if they are exposed to nature they don't necessarily need to fall in love with it and be obsessed with it um, in in the way that perhaps we are but we know that if they then drift away from it throughout their adolescence and early adulthood um, there's a very good chance they'll come back to it at some point so it's really important to instill that formative interest in natural history and i think sometimes we fret a lot of about um, you know adolescent and and young adults disappearing, but they come back, and and they certainly come back when they start a family of their own. So you know that's something that we must bear in mind. You've got to be patient sometimes. Um, having said that, I think that a lot more young adults are now becoming more aware of wildlife and its value through the concerns that we have in terms of our climate and ecological emergency, because that's something that's going to impact directly upon their lives. And they are becoming aware of the fact that a healthy ecological community where they live or across the planet is essential to their survival and certainly to, to, to that of a family if they have a family at any point. So I think it's they're being drawn into it now, uh, whether they like it or not, uh, because of wider concerns. And that's not a bad thing. Absolutely. And now even in school curriculum, which I mean, it wasn't when I was in primary school, which I think is amazing. Which is brilliant. I'm going to come in with a question for Chris quickly. Uh, Chris, why are you wearing a coat indoors? Right, um, because I've recently moved house and I've failed to um, negotiate or liaise effectively with the people who provide the fuel and it's run out. The last <laughs> few days I've been having cold shaves, cold showers and um, sitting in a very cold house. However, I'm promised that at some point this afternoon they will be bringing um, its colour gas that I have because the property is, is remote. Although I have to say I'm very excited at the moment because I met some engineers the other day and they are talking about the potential of uh, in replacing the colour gas, fossil fuel, uh, with an, uh, an air source heat pump so i'm investigating that at the moment and i'm pleased to say that there is at this point in time a government grant available to encourage people to install these heat pumps uh, which do require a small amount of electricity occasionally but are certainly going to be a lot cleaner than my 
color gas. Um, so at the moment, I'm going through a process of revising um, and constantly updating and challenging my carbon footprint and seeing what I can do to reduce it. So the, the, we, I've got a meeting after Christmas with them. They've gone away to do some research, um, and I'm quite excited about being able to Basically, then I, uh, my electricity comes from a green supplier, Ecotricity, um, and that would mean then that I pretty much, you know, I've got solar on the roof. Um, so I will get, be getting towards that point where, you know, I've done what I can to try and minimise my domestic carbon footprint. And energy is a massive challenge. But just before we get on to environmental challenges, I'd just like us all to say hi to Jeff and hi to Zoe, Zoe Creasy who are watching and say, if you are watching, please can you say hi in the chat? We'd love to talk to you. Tell us where you are and also tell us if you've got a pet, what it's called, and also do submit questions. If you've got any questions that you'd like to put to, to either Bailey or to Chris, we'd really love to hear them. So pop them in the chat and again, hi to Zoe. And Zoe, you talked about the research that Chris is helping the University of Lincoln with. And uh, if you look at Chris's feed, uh, we're doing some research around uh, uh, dogs and how they support uh, autistic people and children and also how how you choose a dog if if you are an autistic person so that's some really exciting research going on and straight away we've got a question from Macy White so this is for both of you I'm going to start with you Chris because it picks up on energy what is your favorite renewable energy well I think it would be solar um, because we would require the smallest amount of land space to power the world if we were to use contemporary solar technology and solar technology is moving very rapidly in terms of its efficacy um, the chinese are investing very heavily in the development of that technology and in fact solar energy um, i know at the moment they are one of the worst countries when it comes to burning coal but I don't think that's going to last too much longer. The Chinese have woken up the, to the need to use renewable energy some time ago, and they're investing enormously in that. Um, and I think that, uh, frankly, I would, I, for me, it's the time to get tough. And, and I would insist that contemporary, you know, new build houses, developments, uh, there's a number of things which I would make mandatory. So firstly, good quality insulation. There's no point in heating a home if the heat's just going to pour out of it. So rather than some of the substandard insulation that's still fitted to housing, I think it should be, you know, no question, it's got to be the best. Secondly, uh, grey water uh, management. So, I mean, why are we pouring all that bath water, shower water, just straight back, you know, down the drain when it can be used for secondary purposes? And then thirdly, um, looking at community uh, shared energy in terms of wind, perhaps solar, um, and certainly again, things like uh, heat pumps, all of which are, are out there and working in a, in a functional fashion. But I wouldn't allow developers to dilly-dally any longer. I, I would make these things mandatory. And of course, it may well add um, to the house price um, a, a little, but in the long term, it would save people money on their energy expenditure and, and contribute significantly to reducing our and their carbon footprint. And Bailey, do you have a favourite energy? I agree with Chris in terms of solar and its efficiency. I think for me, it's that closest to home thing again. Um, in North, I'm sort of surrounded by um, wind energy. And when you look out into the wash, it is a sea of wind energy, almost. Um, and so I like to see that and think that it's making a difference. But yeah, having it mandatory, new building regs, that kind of thing, that would be incredible. No, that's good. Now we've got loads of hellos. So I'm just going to say hi to Jane, who's got a dog called Mitzi. She, uh, and then hi to Grace, who's from Gloucester and has a cat called Fred. She's going to go to university to study zoology. And it's very privileged, she says, to hear from you both. Bethany in York has got two dogs, Dougie and Daisy. Katie from Lincoln has a cat called Morrissey. Uh, good choice. And wants to ask Chris and you, Bailey, about your thoughts on the impact of COVID uh, on the interest in nature and specifically Spring Watch and Autumn Watch this year. And before we take that, Mario has two. Oh, gosh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Chris. Axolotis. Axolotls. Axolotls. So the question is, sorry. 
Yeah, no, they were a neotenous salamander. So neotenous meaning that they remain in their infant state throughout the course of their life, which is something that I tried to do up until about the age of 45, I think, to be honest with you. And still are, and still are. No, not really. Mm. But yes, so the impact of COVID on nature and specifically Spring Watch and Autumn Watch. Yeah, well, firstly, the, the real impact on nature. So did nature benefit from us locking down and reducing our activities in the countryside and our expenditure of fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera? Um, in truth, we, we're not entirely sure about that because it's still only November. And the activities were reduced in March. And it takes scientists a little bit of time to gather the data, crunch the numbers and come up with any anything meaningful. Um, anecdotally, we know that wildlife seemed or certain types of wildlife seemed to prosper when we were less active. And I would imagine that here in the New Forest, where we have a problem with um, dog walkers, actually, of which I'm one, um, in springtime, their dogs disturbing ground nesting birds, there were a lot less people out and about. So one would imagine that those ground nesting birds may have had a more successful breeding season we'll have to wait and see it was sad to hear this week um, that climate scientists around the world looked at emissions to see if there was any any significant reduction in emissions thanks to the lockdown and very sadly uh, they determined that at this point in time there hadn't been but i'm going to hand over to bailey now because my delivery is arriving Chris, while Chris gets his delivery, Bailey, I am going to come to you, but just for a minute, can I say hi to Paula from Cambridgeshire, who's got an assistant dog called Ella, Sarah, whose cat Trixie Hobbits is, and Phoebe, who's writing an essay. Good luck, Phoebe. Um, Jess wants to know about being a vegan, whether that's a good thing. Hannah, hi, Hannah. Oh, Freya's just got an offer from Lincoln. Hi, Freya. We'll see you. We'll see you soon. And Paula from Hayfield, with a Jack, who used to have a Jack Russell called Heidi. Uh, Lucy, who's in the health and social care team. Hi, Lucy. Phoebe, who's got a cockapoo called Ralph. That's a good choice. And Jess with a beagle called Sammy. And I think that, oh, Macy's got an offer as well. So Bailey, choose any question that you'd like to answer. I think firstly, it needs to be addressed that Trixie Hobbits is, is the best animal name that I've ever heard. And I 100% approve of that. Um, and it's made me forget all what weighs up for a second. But yes, yeah, so the question was about COVID. I think it definitely went to the bottom of people's agendas for a while when COVID first hit. People were a little bit more concerned about how we we're going to get through lockdown. Um, it was amazing to see so many pe more people getting out and about. Um, whether they're dumping their masks out and about is another story. It's weighing up, like Chris said, yes, it's great, but also there are downsides to everything. The cutting emissions, amazing, but the pollution from masks and PPE, single use plastics, not so good. Um, but I think COVID has taught us some really valuable things, probably two things. Firstly, that we don't need to travel across the country to have a meeting. We can do what we're doing right now and just Zoom each other or Teams each other, which I think is going to help us in the future if we don't need to come into work so often. Maybe we do two days a week, but we don't need to use full five days a week. I think that's really important. But also the most important thing, I think that it's taught us how to be a community and how if we all do like pull together we can actually make a difference and that is what we need to do with climate change with global warming that's exactly what we need to do if we could pull together like we have done for covid and clapping the nhs we can do the exact same thing to clap the environment and you know actually make a big difference all together so chris bailey's just said something absolutely brilliant she's been saying that we should travel less and we've learned good lessons from covid that we don't need to fly around the world but also that we can be kind to each other and joanna has come in to ask two questions she's got a cat called mr wendell uh how are you going to tackle environmental challenges but do you really think veganism is the answer and i'm going to throw into that the question of food because I think previously when we've spoken, Chris, we've agreed that food is actually one of the biggest environmental challenges of, of the modern age. So would you mind picking up on that one, Chris? 
Yeah, I, I, let's, let's start at the end and, and talk about food. I've been speaking about food today because um, the Bureau of Investigative Journalists has exposed that um, soybean produce has been coming from the Cerrado, an area previously of uh, tropical forest in Brazil, where there's been widespread burning and deforestation, which is detrimental to the, the weather in Brazil and the world's biodiversity, of course, as a large number of species live there, a large number of endemic species, which can only be found there, are disappearing very rapidly. And this has been traced to be coming into the UK and going to farms where chickens are fed. And those chickens are going to Tesco's, Aldi, Lidl, um, Nando's and McDonald's. Now, the problem for the consumers is that when they go into those uh, outlets, they cannot make an informed decision about which produce to buy, which is environmentally friendly. So it's to, therefore, at the moment, we are focusing our efforts at lobbying the companies, in this case, the, the, the foodstuffs manufacturers and the chicken producers, um, because we can't, you and I, as consumers, make that choice because food labelling is so poor in the UK. You can see how, some, how much something costs in terms of the pound in your pocket, but you can't see how much it costs environmentally. And if you could see that, I think many people would now be thinking about balancing their budget against the, the budget of the environment and how that's going to impact them at some stage in, in, in the future. So that's the first thing. Food is important. And I think that more than anything, food is the way that everyone um, interacts with nature on a daily basis because we are eating something that's been produced by ecosystem services earth it's come out of the soil it's it's been harvested in in some form fish from the sea um, uh, and so forth um, and it's that that connects us um, to nature and it's perhaps surprising therefore to many people that when they're buying something in a supermarket aisle in the uk they are making a, a direct link to an area of Brazil, which is being ravaged, uh, destroyed and, and deforested. Um, and the world is a small place. So standing in your supermarket aisle in Lincoln or wherever you are in the UK, you are effectively connected to that other part of the world. And your connection, if you're purchasing it, is exacerbating its destruction. Um, I'm not blaming you because I say it's very difficult for you and I to know to know that. Thankfully, this uh, the journalists have been doing their their good work. So we should be thinking about what we're eating, not just from a you know nutritional point of view, an economic point of view, um, and a, and, a, and our health point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. And I think that's why quite a lot of people are becoming vegan more than ever before. But it isn't a one-stop shop to ethical eating. Um, you know, you can still buy a lot of vegan food, which is very heavily packaged in plastic. You can still buy a lot of vegan food, which is full of palm oil, which is another product which comes from uh, in the, primarily Indonesia, um, which has resulted in 95% of the Indonesian rainforest being destroyed since 1995. Um, and it's in biscuits and it's in cakes and it's in many food sources. It's even in the fuel. In, in our cars if we're driving a petrol or diesel car because it's a component of that biofuel there. So if you want to eat as ethically as possible, um, you've got a lot of decisions to make and a lot of research to do. And that research would make, be made a lot easier if our manufacturers and supermarkets were giving us the option to make informed decisions through proper food labeling. And I think that at some stage in the future, I, if not others, should be leading campaigns to put pressure on those retailers to make sure that we can make informed decisions because at the moment we can't it's even hard you know i can pull out something from the cupboard behind me and i'd be squinting here like this trying to find out if it's got palm oil in because they've come up with 40 different names for palm oil in the uk so 40 chemical names you've got to learn to be able to spot it and with the best will in the world, people will live busy lives. They're not going to be doing, you know, doing this in, in, in Tesco's and Aldi and Lidl, um, trying to find out, you know, what's what's in there. It needs to be boldly printed on, on, on the cover so that we can make the right decisions. So what we put on our kitchen table becomes a political decision. So, Bailey, one for you as a campaigner, what can young people do? How can you stand that? How can you how can you change that? 
It's so, yeah, as Chris says, it's such a broad topic. We think, oh, if we're eating less meat, then we must be doing better for the planet. And I have days I try to reduce the meat, the amount of meat that I have in my diet. And even when I have completely vegetarian day, if I'm having a bowl of cornflakes for breakfast, which I do pretty much every day, it's got palm oil in it. So then it that it is so many different things. I think we need to look at all these things and like Chris says, do our research. I think if they're not going to give it to us, perhaps we need to have a look ourselves, um, but obviously we've learned 40 different names of palm oil, that something. Kind of that almost needs to be a, a rating for how sort of eco-friendly food is on all packaging for all food, like a universal rating or at least a, a national one, um, which takes into account all of these different things. Um, I think the best thing that we can do is a bit of everything. I think if we, if we reduce the amount of meat in our diet, we have a look to see if palm oil is in it, if we source stuff locally produced, just like someone said on the comments, I think Joanna said, yeah, yeah locally yeah. food, that's great. Um, look, all the different things, but also don't stop with food. Look at where you buy your clothes. Is that sustainable cotton? Is it second hand? Is it? There's so many different things that we need to do that we need to pull together as a community, as a population. And it's not just down to Chris, is it? No. It can't just be down to Chris to do this for us. We we have to do it for ourselves. And I'm going to move us on a bit because I, I know time is tight. And the, the other really massive environmental challenge that I think we face is the challenge of stuff. And you've described this, Chris, as an upgrade culture. So I'm yeah. going to ask you to explain for everyone what, what that means and what the threat is. Yeah. OK, well, I can illustrate that with something that's always close to all of us these days, and that's our mobile phones, um, because in the UK, we replace these on average every 18 months. We upgrade them. Now, this I have a SIM only contract and this is a, a, an Apple iPhone, I'm not advertising Apple. It's a choice that I, I make to have. It integrates with everything else that I've got. Um, and it costs, I think, I, I, you know, it's quite, it's, this is an eight. So it's quite old. I think they're on 12 now. And I think it cost me about 600 pounds. But what is the environmental cost of this phone? You know, it's full of precious metals which are being mined in parts of Africa by miners who are working in horrendous conditions um, where women are sold into slavery for prostitution, where they're not properly paid, where there's no health and safety. So the human conditions are producing this, that's just at the point of, of, of mining, you know, some of the minerals that are required for the battery, etc. Then you've got the conditions um, in the factory. Then you've got the fact that this has been shipped all around the world. I mean, I could go on and on. I don't, I don't need to. And then every 18 months, we essentially throw this away and get another one simply because the camera may be a little bit better or it offers some other feature. I think if we were sensible, what we would, we would do is have a, a modular phone. So as we make technological improvements in terms of memory, battery, music storing capacity, um, video, uh, you know, capturing uh, capability, we would just plug something into it. We'd unplug something and replace that, not, not the entire item. And the phone is perhaps symbolic of our constant aspiration to have new stuff, which we are told is better stuff. But what I always say to people is, you know, how happy does this make me, you know, my phone? You know, how much happiness does this engender in, in my life? I mean, I quite like looking at a picture of Scratchy, my dog, on here. It's relatively convenient. I can access my emails. I can access a world of information through, um, through the Internet. So that's all good. But it doesn't actually make me happy. In fact, it probably makes me unhappy because it never stops ringing and I never have any time to do anything other than answer it. So, you know, being happy is nothing to do with stuff. You know, I don't think that you can just keep getting stuff and think that you'll keep getting happier. Because I see people who are inordinately rich and they've got a lot more stuff than I've got or would ever want, and they're no happier than me. So stuff doesn't make us happy. You know, it may make life a little bit more convenient, but in terms of our quality of life, our mental and physical well-being, it's, it's not doing that. And I think that, again, consumption of everything, whether it's fuel, food, clothing, phones, just all of the stuff in our lives is what's driving that, you know, that it's a vicious circle of climate, biodiversity loss. It's all intrinsically intertwined. 
And if we were to be able to you know, enhance the qualities of our lives, so we still have a very good quality of life, but cut down the amount of stuff, cut down our consumption, then the world would very clearly be a more sustainable and a healthy place. And we've, we, but we've been brainwashed. We've got this mindset whereby we, we want stuff. I'm getting fed up with stuff, to be quite honest, which is why I've still got my iPhone 8, and I have no intention of replacing this. And when the battery goes, I will have it replaced, you know, by Jim around the back of the bike sheds for a few pounds. Um, and, 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 and this will go to its absolute bitter end. And that's something that I've learned. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I've got lots of stuff. Famously, I once ex ex exposed on television that I had eight hoovers. I'm very pleased to tell you now that I've given three of them away. I've not replaced the one that, that two that have got broken, and I'm now currently down to four hoovers. And as they disintegrate, I won't be replacing them. I'll be getting the brush out. A hoover habit can be a challenge for everyone. I think. I, I don't think. I have to admit, I have a bit of a hoover hoover habit. I've got. Four, so so yeah, yeah. I like Hoover's too. But Bailey, what about stuff? What about recycling? What about reusing? What's what's gone wrong? Do you think? Yeah, I think it's that to to sell stuff, we're being told that we have to have the better we have to have the better one, we have to have the upgrade. And actually, I think my dad right now would turn around to me and say, if it isn't broke, why are we trying to fix it? Um which is a valid point, actually. Yeah, I think it's coming up to Christmas, isn't it? And everyone says, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? And I say to them, just adopt an animal and WWF for me. Or buy me a T-shirt that, that gives loads of proceeds to charity. Or just make a donation on my behalf because I don't want more stuff. And I think actually for students, it's really handy to not have too much stuff because you're moving every year and you, you don't want to be carrying around all that all these things and I always like to think could I move house in a suitcase and to be honest, I couldn't and but I would like to I'd like to be able to do that well all the things that actually like Chris said makes me happy and makes my life enriched could I move house all that stuff in one go and as ever Bailey that is a genius point there have been lots of people in the chat saying what could the supermarkets do what could government do what could Extinction Rebellion do and actually there in, in your answer you've given us all one thing that we could do that would make a massive difference is when someone says what do you want for Christmas say no I, I, I don't need anything I, I don't need anything you know just make a donation do do something and are there any other sort of quick wins chris that other people can do that to to make a difference well i think you know if you've got stuff um recycle it give it to other people i mean i've just moved house and i've discovered an embarrassing amount of stuff in fact my partner charlotte and megan have been um cursing my stuff because they've been helping me carry the boxes full of the damn thing yeah, you know, but um, I've given an enormous amount to charity. I've given things to friends and, and family, you know, where they've had things that they needed. Um, and I've tried seriously to just reduce it. And I think this year, my New Year's resolution for this year was not to buy any clothes, to have a, a year where I just bought nothing at all. And I have stuck to it. Um, you know, I've got a couple of things. People have sent me T-shirts. There's one here. It's a campaign T-shirt. So it's not that I haven't had things coming in, um, but I haven't originated their pur uh, purchase. And I decided to have a, you know, I went to my wardrobe. How many coats does a man need when it's cold? Ultimately, you know, and, and so I've given quite a lot of my coats away to people, loads of my T-shirts away, unworn, I should, should add, not tatty old ones that were smelly. Um, and, and I think that, you know, if we share things like this and uh, then again, that's a means of cutting that consumption. It's a means of reusing them, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's a key thing. Don't throw it away. If people can use it, then give it to them or sell it to them on an internet auction site if you want to try and recoup some of the money. And we've got two really good comments, actually, that have just come in. Paula Knott has said she she graduated Open University in 1990, 
nine, having studied environmental development. And she's really frustrated by the lack of change, but she believes that 2020 is teaching people they don't need stuff and clutter. And we've been reminded of the importance of the little things of nature and crafts, of recycling and upcycling. And then so pretty, so mindful, um, has said that they're having a great family discussion in the lounge and they're really keen to see stuff upcycled. And as a dressmaker, she loves the 16th century art of Shishiko. Have I said that right, Chris? That's making resurrection. I, I'm not Shish familiar with that, I have to say. Um, I can't believe that's something you don't know about. Hmm. You're like walking hmm. Wikipedia. You can ask me about front engine racing Ferraris from the 1950s and their valve timings, but do not ask me about 16th century dressmaking. Seriously, you've really pushed it there, Ellie. Oh, I, mean, I can't, I can't believe, believe it. I've found, I can't <laughs> believe it. I, I do, you have, you have made me think, no, I do have a question. I've got, I've got, a, I've got a, well, maybe a silly question. Favourite oh, song. I'm going to have to Google it now. I've got it's, to know. It's I'm, spelled S-A-S-H-I-K-O. -S Shishiko, okay. do you know what it is, Bailey? I I'm have a clue. I think we should get Chris's sister on here, actually. Maybe. <laughs> yes. She know, Chris. We've got the wrong packum. <laughs> yeah. Jenny. I'm gonna, so S A S H I K O. Someone said it's repairing clothes by sewing in nice patterns. It sounds like the sewing bee to me. I love the sewing bee. I, I do like to sew. It's very, very cathartic sewing. So that's that's all really, really lovely. Tell us when you found it, Chris, and we'll be. I have, yes. It's a Japanese word, um, and it refers to a form of decorative reinforcement, stitching, or functional embroidery from Japan that started out during the, uh, with a practical need during the Edo area, 1615 uh, to 1868. And it was traditionally used to reinforce points of wear or repair and worn t uh, and, re and repair tears with patches, making the piece ultimately stronger and warmer. Well, there we are. I Learn love something. That. I love that. That's amazing. Everyone should do that. I think do that for Christmas. Do some shishiko. Yeah. I I, I, don't, get, don't get me to check the pronunciation. We'll be here all day. But I mean, that is exactly what we should be doing, but not just with our clothes, with everything else. You know, it is about re repair um, and restore and not replace. That is brilliant. Now, I'm going to invite Darren in. Darren is our producer, all-round genius, who you've met before, both of you. Darren Thank has you. got an important announcement to make, I believe. Is that correct, Darren? That is correct, yeah. So many viewers will know that we've been running a photography competition over the past couple of weeks um, to sort of celebrate this, uh, celebrate having you back, Chris. Um, and what we've asked viewers to do is to take photos uh, of the of the environments around them or wildlife around them and take photos of things that they would miss um if we didn't fix the climate essentially um and so we've had hundreds of photos come through lots of really really brilliant ones in fact they're all brilliant and what we'll probably do um after this is we'll share all of the photos on our social media so if you want to uh, check them out come back to our facebook um later this week and we'll make sure they're all shared but we do have one standout one, which is our winner. And Chris, um, if you're happy to, I think we're ready to announce our winner. Okay, so the winner was, photo show us the winning photograph. It's a fabulous picture of two otters, um, Eurasian otters, taken by Danielle Tinker. And here, stretched out on a rock after a busy morning's fishing for crabs. Look at the one in the foreground. That's definitely a, a belly full of crustaceans or fish, whatever it's managed to, to feed upon there. And then nuzzling over the shoulder, the, the second otter. And what I like about the second otter is that it's making eye contact with the photographer. So there's a direct engagement with that animal. You know, we are you know, drawn to that animal's face. And of course, otters have become a very popular animal in recent times. Well, say recent, last 50 years. Um, and their little black button noses, their, their lovely fur, um, they are exquisite animals. And I have to say again, when I were a kid, and I've said it three times now, um, otters were 
uh, very much restricted in their range. They'd suffered terribly, you know, post the Industrial Revolution through river pollution. Uh, they were hunted, of, uh, of course, for a long time. Um, and then the pesticide crisis of the 50s and 60s all but finished them off. And they hung on in the Wales, the west of England and Scotland. But a couple of years ago, the Environment Agency were very pleased to say um, that they had now been found in every English county. So that's throughout Wales, Scotland, and England too. And the last county that they were they returned to was was Kent in the southeast of England. So it's a, it's a cracking photo. It's a lovely cameo of otter family life, showing some very satisfied, full tummied otters, and it directly engages with the with the viewer, which is excellent. So congratulations to Danielle Tinker for that lovely picture of one of our most favourite animals. Oh, that's fabulous! Thank you. And and Darren, what what's Danielle going to win? So Danielle's going to win one of our um, goodie bags. So it's going to be filled with lots of treats from the university. So we'll get in touch, Danielle, and we'll we'll reach out to you and send you information on how we can get that to you. I'm going to say hi to the lovely Natalie Mawson, who's uh, got in touch. Coral, Summon, Kelly, so pretty. I'm happy that you're happy. Doctor and me, that's brilliant. And, uh, oh, Bailey, what were we going to say about otters? We never meet that we don't talk about otters. Would you like to do an otter update? Yes, it's true. Myself and Ellie I just permanently talk about otters. But we have a family of otters that live in the Brayford Pool, and I see them on my walks to work. Not anymore, because we're working from home, but usually see them swimming around as a family and making their amazing otter sounds. And I did try to get the Students' Union to change our um, mascot to an otter, but it's sticking at a swan. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love to see them swimming around and they're just so, they're such gorgeous creatures. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just beautiful. Yeah, I think we are the only university in the world with otters <laughs> right outside our Students' Union. And Chris, you sometimes do a biodiversity uh, thing on campus, don't you? Yeah, we've done some what we call bio blitzes. So we basically count the number of different living things that we can find at a given time in that given place as a means of assessing community health, really, because the more species that can live there, the better, obviously, for the sustainable um, stability of that community. And, and otters would not have been there a few years ago, a combination of water quality. And one thing that we've seen with otters is that, again, a change not just in their distribution, but their habits as well. So when I were a kid, fourth time, um, they were almost entirely nocturnal. Um, but now they've become increasingly diurnal and also a lot more tolerant of human disturbance. So you will see them in inner city areas. We see them in Salisbury and over here, relatively close to, to my home, Winchester too, all of which are towns that have rivers running through them. Um, and again, in, in Lincoln, a, a, a large metropolitan city with its university, of course, fringing that Brayford pool, but the otters are, are, are content to be there amongst people. So that's a, a change in their behaviour as well as their distribution, which is, which is really good to see. Now we're running out of time, but Chris is the coolest visiting professor in the world. And there's a wonderful question from Doris that I'd quite like to, to answer if we can, Chris, quickly. She says, um, my question was about the ways of talking to our families, friends and acquaintances who perhaps don't care about the environment much or don't believe people have such negative impact. They just want to enjoy their lives. Um, what, what, what can you say to Doris? How can she get her friends and family to, to care as much as she does? I think that you've got to connect the problems to the person. If there's a barrier between, you know, the problem which you might recognise that, that exists and, and that person, you, you've got to join them, basically. So you've got to find a point of commonality, perhaps a point of shared interest, which, which you can use as a bridge to explain the things that concern you. And this might be an environmental issues, as that's what we're discussing here. So give me just one second. Just got to... Um, that's fine. I'm going to do a really quick coming soon because we have to go because we've got uh, another session that we have to do in a minute. But uh, coming up next week on the 3rd of December, we're welcoming back Bailey, but she's coming with her mum. And that's a really special parent session, isn't it, Bailey? Yeah, absolutely. She's going to tell you all the dirt, I'm sure. 
that would be brilliant. We're really looking forward to that. Uh, the following week, we've got one of our students, Sophie, who's been doing amazing videos for us, um, cooking videos, exercise videos for students in lockdown. And she'll be giving us her top tips for surviving university as we head towards Christmas. And then on the 16th of December, we've got a virtual open day and you can find out all about coming to this really fabulous university and a little bit about our city. So I think it comes to me because we're running over to say a massive thank you for staying with us tonight. I really hope you've enjoyed our wonderful guests as much as I have. Uh, they're just amazing. I love working with all three of these guys. I'm very lucky. So thank you very much. And I'll leave it to Bailey and Chris and Darren to say goodbye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>